Continuing our march to the International Conference on Nutrition and Medicine here on the Exam Room Podcast brought to you by the Physicians Committee. Hi, I am the weight loss champion, Chuck Carroll. And my next guest is originally from Puerto Rico, who now lives outside of Philadelphia. But check this out. She spends her time volunteering working with families that don't have any insurance, working with them on their health, teaching them the benefits of eating a plant-based diet. She is also a lecturer, she is a teacher, and she is an author. She is an all-around inspiration. And with that, we welcome Dr. Anna Negron to the exam room. Thank you so very much for being here. Thank you for the invitation. You are quite uh, the remarkable person. How do you find time to do all of these things? Well, Chuck, I don't really answer to anyone, so I can really (laughs) make my own time and, um, you know, follow my passion and my expertise. And um, I say yes to many projects that are dear to my heart. I love that. I don't answer to anybody, so I can do what what I want. And and you are giving back your time in the most generous and healthful of ways. Um, let's get into your story and find out why you're so passionate about these projects. Let's start with you growing up in Puerto Rico. Can you give us an idea of what the standard diet in Puerto Rico is like? Well, we're talking a long time ago, Chuck, because I'm 73. Oh, you age yourself. So oh. Time, that's important because, you know, you have, you're you asking me to remember what was the diet when I was growing up. It was a lot of rice and beans and very simple salads and uh, many, many fruits because tropical countries are, you know, really abundant in, in fruits. And of course, there were pieces of meat and bacalao, which is codfish and um, and bread and chicken. But that was really not what I remember the most. What do you remember the most? What I remember the most were the was a, a man who came pushing a cart from the farmers market, which was you know a couple of miles away. Uh, who brought fresh f- vegetables and fruits and and rice and legumes uh, to through the streets? And I would, you know, come out with my mom, and she would buy the fresh produce, and he would hand me some little bits that I could just uh, pretend to cook myself as well. That that's something that I truly remember. Plus, I lived with surrounded by mango trees and panapen trees which is a breadfruit and avocado trees lemon tree in the backyard so okay so the is is mango is is that the most popular fruit that's grown uh, in puerto rico or um is is there something else because here in the washington dc area and i would assume uh, near you in philadelphia you're not going to find a mango tree no matter how hard you look of course, because it's a tropical fruit. But you know, I have to give you a little bit of history in this respect. Many of the, or much of the agricultural land of Latin America has been over the last hundred years taken in by investors who planted cash crops. You know, bananas and um, sugarcane and coffee beans, so that um, we did grow up with these trees around, but the plentiful fruits that we would have, you know, 100 years ago has been really dwindled. Oh, my gosh. Okay. Um, that That's a little bit disheartening to hear. And by a little bit, I mean a lot. But it sounds to me that uh, still all in all things considered, when you hear about what the standard American diet is today, and then you look at what it was that you grew up eating, you were certainly on a healthier track then than I think that a lot of children here in America are on today, wouldn't you say? For sure, for sure. And, you know, part of the history that we share all the Latin American countries, because we are, we are not just Puerto Ricans, you know, who grew up on the island and transplanted here, but people from Guatemala, Mexico, uh, Honduras, etc. people are following or looking for jobs because the the countryside, you know, was taken up by these cash crops and all this immigration or this migration that you see 
is really looking for jobs that then you know are in um, nothing like what uh, people grew up with. They are in dishwashing and landscaping and cleaning, paying much less than the wealth that's been siphoned from theirs, our countries. So less income. And if you look at the statistics and here in the States, and I'm sure that this is a global epidemic as well, um, it seems that generally speaking, uh, the less income, the less wealth you have, uh, the poorer your health outcomes would be. Um, and so that kind of begins this vicious cycle. And I know that one of the things that you are, are working on, as we said at the top, is working with families uh, who don't have insurance, don't have a lot of income, and kind of showing them how to eat and live healthfully, uh, despite the fact that they're on a very limited budget. So how is it that you you are able to walk these families through, you know, these walk them into a healthier lifestyle despite the fact that they have limited means right now. This is the irony that the poor people's food, which they which they grew up on, um, you know, what's keeping them healthy. Uh, what makes the difference is coming to this country where the income is really very low um, in terms of what they can buy with that. So there's a there's a disconnect, you know, between what they used to eat, which was really connected to the land, which was really the the corn, the the, the beans, the squash, and all the different crops that uh, sustained communities, to coming here and suddenly being flooded with food that's uh, industrialized. Because I wouldn't even say it's Americanized. You know, it's really industrialized. It's it's the nuggets and the pizzas and the and the packaged foods. And what I do is not so much teach people, Chuck, it's really help them remember. They've been cut off from their roots in their countries and now here. And what, we, what I am doing with them, which is so rewarding, is to remember the spices, the ingredients, and revalue that which has been devalued and maybe marginalized as just not good because now in this country there's other food like meat and cheese and, and eggs and uh, all this that's really making people overweight, obese, have diabetes, heart disease. I love the way that you put that, helping them to remember. Uh, I think that that's such a, an important distinction. Um, Let's talk about those health trends that you were just mentioning here. Uh, obesity seems to be an epidemic as well. Um, specific to the Latin uh, community, what are we seeing right now in the obesity trends? Are they skyrocketing the same as they are with virtually everyone else? Sadly, yes. And with the overweight and obesity come diabetes. When I say that I see patients in the, in the clinic, Maybe some days, Chuck, everybody has diabetes, type two diabetes, a disease that's really man-made, man-made by just eating fat that gets into your cells and keeps the sugar from getting in and being used. And it's just so simple. And the reversal is what's really hard to e explain and to practice because who wants to say, or who wants to admit that the food that they are now eating, you know, in this big progressive country of ours, um, responsible for their disease. It can't be. <laughs> what I would imagine that some of those conversations are quite difficult that you're having with, with patients at your clinic. Um, but at other times, I would imagine that some, sometimes it, the connection would come quite quickly and it would make sense that, perhaps they are overweight because of the food choices that, or because of the food that they, they are eating. But how do you, proverbially speaking here, crack that nut and help people to really make that connection when it's so hard for them to make that admission that you were just talking about? It's not easy. It's not easy because people are stretched for time and, and for bandwidth, you know, so that um, the convenient food, the, um, you know, the markets, the, the, the people who work 
from sunrise to sunset and then uh, only have like the food truck or the convenience store available. Um, they say, even if they understand it, it's really hard for them to say, how can I plan for it? And, and if I might add, you know, say children going to school or even at the women's in, infants and children, the WIC, you know, what they are being fed or given as a way to bridge the gap, you know, between their economy and, and, and all this is just the food that we want them not to eat. So it's the cheese and the eggs and the, and the milk. Ah. Uh, yeah. Ah is right. I mean, I can, I can hear the frustration in your voice. So what kind of advice are you giving to help people, you know, plan a little bit better while still keeping those costs down when you just hit the nail on the head that, you know, cheese is, is subsidized, dairy is subsidized, a lot of meat is subsidized, and yet all of these healthy foods uh, are very much not and can be quite a bit more expensive. So what advice are you offering to people? Well, first I would say that the food that's ex um cheap is artificially cheap, like you just mentioned, and that the healthy food is um, not expensive, but it's really worth its value. That's number one. Number two, I have been since 2003, gathering people and cooking with them, not for them. It's not a, it's not a, a demonstration. People come and they cook with me. And now this last year, it's been online via Zoom, you know, another platform that has been really very helpful to us. So it's really saying we don't have to become Americans or industrialized food eaters. We can recover the food of our country, the food of our family, the food of our tradition, and simply leave out the meat, cheese, eggs, and oil. <clears throat> and as people practice, they become excited about really recovering the roots. I love the, again, recovering, rediscovering, getting back in touch with the roots. The seeds, it, it sounds like in this case, have already been planted. So it's not such a radical idea. It's just looking to the past for a healthier future. Um, I love that. I love that so much. Um, we mentioned diabetes. Uh, I'm curious about the trends also in the Latin community for heart disease. Are they also rising? They are rising, uh, alarmingly so, except that many of the people that I see, Chuck, are <clears throat> still um, on, the, er, on the younger side. So that what they're developing is the risk factors for you know, the overt heart disease that they will have um, an, a manifestation for. So when I, when I see people in their 20s and 30s, I see type 2 diabetes because they just simply um, it's, you know, high cholesterol, high blood pressure. Uh, they are the silent diseases, the silent risk factors and overweight and obesity. But yes, heart disease is also. Uh, you know, when you're in your 20s, I think that a lot of us still have this feeling that we're invincible. We're indestructible. Nothing bad can possibly happen to us. Um, but that is, uh, as you were just saying, that's when we're starting to see the high blood pressure, the high cholesterol, all of these, all of these things that eventually can lead to heart disease. Um, I heard recently that this current generation may see a, a drop in life expectancy. Is that holding true also for the Latin community? Are, are you aware of that? Absolutely. <clears throat> when you look at the map, the only blue zones in the world, you know, are in Okinawa, Japan, and Sardinia, you know, Italy, and the only blue zones in this hemisphere are in Costa Rica and Loma Linda. So the rest of the country is just following the same trend of overweight, obesity, and um, the diseases that will just kill us quicker. But remind, remember, or not remember, but let's just let us remember that the, what paves the way for the number one killer, you know, heart disease, is silent. People don't know that they have high blood pressure. They don't know that they have high blood sugar until it really... They don't know they have, uh, you know, some of the 
symptoms, you know, the, or the signs unless they get uh, checked. And when you give them medications for diseases that are, and medications that are so hard to, to follow, you know, to take two or three times a day, etc. People go looking for other things. And one of the things that I have met in my practice and in, in the patients that I see is these Herbalife and, um, you know, this, these supplements that people are using <clears throat> instead of the, the medications and sometimes uh, don't, don't even tell the physicians that they're using it because they have a relationship with this person that's coming door to door, you know, telling them that you can, you know, buy this and, and drink this and you don't have to change your diet. You can just use this to, um, to get rid of your diabetes. So I have so many hidden problems. I have so many hidden obstacles that I have been uncovering, not the least of which are many of my colleagues that are still in last century, you know, telling people that they should eat less carbs um, without qualifying which are the less carbs that they should eat. And that is a very interesting conversation. Um, and, and it's interesting to me, I think perhaps the most interesting aspect of that is the fact that there is so many people out there, including doctors who, who you were just saying, your colleagues, um, who view all carbs as being created equally. But your message is is anything but the carbs that you would get from those fresh mango trees back in Puerto Rico much different than the carbs that you would get in the average American Twinkie, aren't they? Absolutely, and not just the you know the mangoes. Let's say some of the crops, Chuck, that are able to sustain communities are something like jackfruit. A jackfruit, if if you live you know in an area where this grew, this is a fruit that can be used green as a meat or ripe as a fruit, and each individual fruit can weigh 25, 30 pounds. Can you imagine how many people can eat from that? Panapens or the breadfruits, they each can be five to 10 pounds, and a tree will just have a bumper crop of them. And you, all you have to do is wait for them to drop. Of course, you have to be really there, otherwise they crack uh, <laughs> on the ground and, oh. But plantains, for example, you know, a, a plantain plant or a, not a banana plant, but a plantain plant, when it's green, it could be used as a potato. When it's ripe, it's really cooked or baked in its skin and it's fantastically sweet, just like a bread pudding. And each plant can have how many hands, 10 or 15 hands, which are bunches and, you know, every every bunch has like 10 or 15 plantains. So imagine the amount of food that you would have just available if we were growing these. And, and a lot of the people who know these foods, who came to this country knowing these foods, can get them in the produce markets because the markets are bringing our foods to the market. I go to markets where I find, you know, cactus pads and Malanga roots, which are like a huge taro root, again, could, could weigh 25, 30 pounds. So there are so many things that are available to us. If we just go past the McDonald's, <laughs> go past the, you know, the food truck and, and plan ahead and remember, perhaps make a little bit of time to once or twice a week because people are very busy you know, cook batches, cook, in, include the whole family. So we already know how to reverse all these diseases. We know how to prevent them. We know how to arrest them. I think our challenge now is how to put that in practice, how to really help people in communities, in families, and with the help or not of the medical community, you know, to recover health because we can't. This is unsustainable, and it's and it's not right. <laughs> not right is putting it very mildly. Um, so, for somebody who's listening to this right now, and they're like, "Well, you know, I, I don't have insurance. 
I don't have a lot of money. My family is just struggling to scrape by right now, but I want to make sure that we're all eating something healthy as well. What are some of the first steps you would recommend that they take to go ahead and eliminate some of the unhealthier eating habits that they've developed and affordably be able to introduce healthier food? When I started my Greens on a Budget you know, website and the cooking with patients, what I really hoped was that with enough greens and oats and rice and beans, the other food would fall off the plate. Because the idea is not really to add more fruits and vegetables, grains, legumes. It's really to replace the things that they're eating now. So when you replace your meat, your chicken, your sugary drinks, your juices, your processed foods, your packaged, you know, your triple washed, whatever, you really end up having a little bit more cash for the unprocessed food that you can then, you know, eat very, very sumptuously, rice, beans, fruits, and legumes. My gosh, I mean, you can, this is another thing we have to do. We've been brainwashed that that food is poor people's food, but we have to make that back into that's healthy people's food. And that's, you know, the earth that's our roots, that's to recover our memory again. Absolutely. $35 a week will have a person, an adult person eat fresh fruits and vegetables. Wow. Dollars a week. Wow. That, that's not talking about the staples that you can buy in bulk, you know, like the dry legumes and the, and the dry rice and oats and maybe the pumpkins and the potatoes, you know, things that are a little bit more durable and the frozen fruits. So once you have your kitchen stocked with some staples, you know, non-perishables, the perishables will cost an adult person $35 a week. And this is not just my experience, but this has been studied and researched and published. So helping people understand and get this notion away that it's, it's more expensive to eat this way because we're perpetuating a myth. And myths very often are lies. <laughs> <laughs> Again, you're just speaking truth right now. Oh my goodness, uh, $35 a week, that is, that is incredible. And then I'm thinking about that $35 total and I would say that you're spending at least that much if you're buying your lunch out every day, if you're stopping by the drive through for dinner every night, right? You can burn through $35 going that route pretty daggone quickly, I would imagine. That probably wouldn't even carry you through an entire week. That's the sad part about it, that many of the men that work, that are single, you know, in this country, we call them jornaleros, you know, they pay for the, they, they get paid for the day, you know, for the work. Mm -hmm. They're leaving half their paycheck at the at the convenience store, buying you know uh, sandwiches and coffee or you know energy drinks because the food that they're eating is not really energizing them. Uh, all the while, you know, gaining a few pounds and becoming more and more sluggish and more and more you know less energized and not connecting the dots. And this is the sad part about it. And let's kind of uh, wrap things up here before we talk about uh, your upcoming presentation at the International Conference on Nutrition and Medicine. I'm curious, what is in your pantry right now? What are Dr. Negron's staples that you always have on hand? Well, this is funny because this is one of the uh, exercises that I do with my patients. It's a virtual kitchen tour, you know, and I ask them to, to tell me what's in their kitchen. Well, I have, of course, rice and beans, all kinds of rices and beans. I have oats, I have quinoa, I have barley, and then I have, you know, frozen fruits, frozen soups that I have made. I have then sweet potatoes, ripe, well, ripening plantains. I have squash. I have, um, what else? Of course, mangoes. And I have, ooh, inside the refrigerator, um, tofu and oat milk and my prepared overnight oats with mashed sweet potatoes and cinnamon and all kinds of, I mean, I could go on and on. And of course, you know, cabbage and bro broccoli, Brussels sprouts, they can, I have two pounds of greens a day. 
um, I go to a Chinese market and I load up on broccoli greens and broccoli tips and so that in a week I am um, I finish what's in the fridge and the next Friday I go and, and I load up. Wow. Two pounds of greens a day. That's an awful lot of chlorophyll. That is amazing. Yes. But they shrivel. They shrivel in the pot. You know, if you cook them, they 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 just you can you can stuff them in. I'm I'm, I'm curious. Uh, on average, what are you paying for two pounds of greens every day? Well, I go to the market with for the Chinese market, and I might come back with you know forty pound forty dollars worth of all the all the greens. And of course, you know I'm I'm buying because I also um, cook and demonstrate and all that. So I'm spending more than thirty five dollars a week, um, but. Sure maybe three, four dollars. And if you go to places where you bag your own thing, you know, you don't really buy them triple washed and all that. It's really inexpensive. Man, that that is just incredible. And by the way, uh, I would love to get that overnight oats recipe that you were giving with the sweet potatoes. And I believe you said some cinnamon was in there as well. Oh my gosh, my mouth started watering. Well, great. Uh, <laughs> that simple, you know, and you, this is the beautiful, Thing about it too that these are templates these people say can you can you re, you know refer me to a recipe book and I say just these are templates you know just ideas and and then you fill in the blanks and you can change salads or salads soups are just hot salads you know a rice you can you can use any kind of grain any kind of bean I mean nature has provided us such a volume variety for the taste of every person on the planet. And you will be speaking at the uh, International Conference on Nutrition and Medicine coming up July 15th through the 17th. Give us a quick little preview of what it is you'll be talking about. I'll be talking about nutrition and health in the Latino communities. And the Latino communities, you know, we're not a one block. We come, like I mentioned, from lots of places. We comprise 18% of the population, that's 60 million people. What we have in common is the language and a complicated history with the United States. Um, and I will be speaking about you know, how our milpa or our agrarian communities were really co-opted and how that has really uh, Tra translated into this migration waves of people who are just uh, forgetting, you know, how to eat and how to stay healthy and then how to recover it because this is the challenge that we have and that we must rise to that challenge. We must also bring our brethren, you know, the, the medical um, colleagues um, need to, they don't have an excuse anymore. You know, 30 years ago when I transitioned, uh, I didn't have any education in medical school about this, but now there's really no excuse. I mean, with the International Conference of Nutrition and Medicine, with the Center for Nutrition Studies at D. Colin Campbell, with the, the American College of Lifestyle Medicine, you can just pick and choose. And of course, you know, my favorite, which is this PCRM where I've been a member since 1990. I grew <laughs> up with you guys before you were born. 1990. Oh my gosh. Well, thank you so much for your support for so many years. Yes, I am. Um, uh, I, I could, I don't know where I would have been without the physicians committee. Well, I know where you should be July 15th through the 17th. That is online with us this year at the International Conference on Nutrition and Medicine. Come check out Dr. Negron's lecture and right now a special offer for those of you who are watching the exam room. If you go to pcrm.org slash ICNM, use the promo code exam room, all one word. When you register, you will save $50 with the promo code exam room, save $50 off the cost of registration to the International Conference on Nutrition and Medicine. Nearly three dozen of the world's leading experts on health and nutrition will be presenting the latest science and data. And as you heard Dr. Negron say, a little bit of health and history as well. And so with that, Dr. Negron, I just want to say thank you so very much for spending some time with us here today. It's been my pleasure, Chuck. Thank you. 
If your health IQ is a couple of points higher than it was a few minutes ago, go ahead and like this video or subscribe to the YouTube channel. And to take it even higher, head over to Apple Podcasts or wherever you get your favorite shows. Look for the exam room by the Physicians Committee. Hit the subscribe button there as well and help to make your world a healthier place.